From the NASDAQ market site in Times Square, I'm Brad Smith, and you're watching the Millennium Report. Today we have a very special guest with us. We've got Angel Rich, who is the CEO and founder of The Wealth Factory, here to discuss how she is taking aim at revolutionizing financial literacy education. And we're going to dive into all of that and more throughout today's segment. But before then, let's toss it over to Justin to see how you can get involved with today's segment. Okay, good morning, Facebook. Listen, we want you to have the most interactive and fun experience you can have. So I want you to do three things for me. I want you to like when you hear something that you enjoy. I want you to comment with your questions. And finally, we want you to share this video with your friends. Take it away, Brad. Awesome. Thanks, Justin. And as mentioned in the lead-in, joining us now, we have Angel Rich, CEO and founder of The Wealth Factory. Angel, great to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Now, let's, let's talk about, uh, first and foremost, a recent Forbes article that came out featuring you, um, which dubbed you as the next Steve Jobs, who we all look up to uh, on, on a millennial level as the epitome of innovation. What does uh, a, a, really, a compliment like that mean to you? It was actually breathtaking. Mm -hmm. um, I woke up and I looked at my Facebook and I had a bunch of friends congratulating me on the article saying, hey, Forbes just called you the next Steve Jobs. And I was like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> and I just started uh, screaming, you know, because it was quite surreal to to receive such an honor like that um, with somebody that I look up to. And I, I secretly in the back of my mind kind of always felt that way since I've seen the movie. But but to have someone else say it, especially Forbes in particular, um, was amazing and still sort of surreal. Yeah, it, when a leading business publication like that comes out and calls calls you such a and gives you such a great compliment, uh, and then can follows it up with a great story as well. Um, you know, kudos to you uh, and, and Forbes for recognizing your talent uh, and, and bringing that to the forefront. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of your personal personal inspirations in business uh, before we dive into um, uh, before we dive into your app. So let's talk about some of your personal inspirations. Who do you look up to in business right now? Well, I've always sort of looked up to Warren Buffett. Okay. Um, I like his approach to sort of market volatility and diversification when it comes to building his stock portfolios. Um, I think that the way that he also dives into real estate yeah. to kind of expand the, the breadth of his product mix is great as well. Um, I, obviously, I, I did look up to uh, Steve Jobs. Um, but I also look, admire Richard Branson mm -hmm. and Jeff Hoffman of Priceline. Uh, Jeff Hoffman has actually become a mentor of mine wow. and just his entire thought process to life and innovation and inventions and giving back to people at the same time has been very inspiring to be able to learn that from him kind of firsthand. Absolutely. Now, and now, Steve Case. Steve Case. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. Um, now, your app has some serious accolades from the likes of the Department of Education, uh, from the office of Michelle Obama herself. Um, so tell us about Credit Stacker. Yes, so Credit Stacker essentially is a play on a match three game, but instead of swapping around diamonds or candy, mm -hmm. you swap around credit types that represent bill payments. So you pay off your debt, achieve a high credit score, and learn from the multiple choice questions. Okay. And we essentially picked apart the Fair Isaac credit reporting system and applied game mechanics to it to simulate credit management. It's literally the only credit game in the world available on Google Play and iOS. We quickly scaled to 40 countries and we've translated it into four languages. At the end of this month, we're mm -hmm. very excited to announce that we're releasing Credit Stack a Saga, okay. which is going to be an expanded version that has more animations and more levels involved in the game to extend gameplay. Absolutely. How's the, the pickup been, you know, has it been received so far? It's been amazing. Uh, we were invited to the White House. Uh, didn't know that we were going to Michelle Obama's <laughs> office until we were getting on the elevator. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it was, I was like, where are we going? <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, so I actually led a meeting with uh, the entire Michelle Obama's team yeah. uh, with joining forces from Michelle Obama's office in her chair. They were yeah. like, you can sit here. I was oh like, gosh. what is happening? Um, so that was amazing. And then we actually launched the mobile version mm -hmm. of the product on the White House National STEM Tour wow. in D.C. and Baltimore. Um, from there, we won uh, Best Learning Game in the Country by Department of Education. Mm -hmm. 
We won Best Solution in the World by J.P. Morgan Chase for reducing poverty. Um, recently, I won Google's pitch competition, and tomorrow I'm going down to Houston as a finalist in the Black Enterprise pitch competition. Absolutely. Well, good luck tomorrow as well. We we have no doubt that you'll uh, you'll make the case for certain. Um, even broader. Uh, when we think about gamification, you, you've used gamification um, to really kind of fill the gap where education has um, almost failed for, for quite some time in teaching those core financial principles uh, that a lot of us need to effectively make that transition into adulthood and managing our own finances and our own money and, and really gaining wealth at the end of the day, too. Um, but, but how do we translation gamification into application uh, as the next step? Yeah, I completely agree with you. Uh, that's actually why before starting my company, I became a global market research analyst okay. for Prudential Financial. So I'm the author of the first ever African-American financial experience study, the reason that there's currently blacks in life insurance commercials. I was able to prove that blacks own more life insurance at an equal or higher value than other races. And when Obama was bringing the troops home in 2010, he actually called on Prudential and they called on me wow. to do the research. And I came up with a plan for employment, housing, and education. And then I conducted about 70 other financial behavioral studies mm -hmm. because I wanted to really figure out the key variables that would actually move behavior mm -hmm. within people from all different type of demographics and learning styles. Mm -hmm. And so we sort of took that research and embedded it within the game um, to be able to simulate that, that sort of uh, behavioral economics play, if you will, sure. but hiding it in a game so you're intrinsically learning the information without necessarily realizing that you're learning it um, because you're motivated by external rewards. Right. So we basically wanted to trick people into improving their financial behavior by teaching them the skills necessary in the game. Mm -hmm. So, so when we think about um, funding and, and some of your competitors out there, uh, you know, I read it through the story, but let, let's talk funding. There's a significant gap in, you know, what your competitors have received and, and what you received. Uh, you know, what, what were the exact numbers? Yes, so um, what's actually interesting <laughs> and a little whatever, um, since the article, uh, my competitor has actually raised $190 million. Wow. Um, and the article stated 75. It's actually 190 million now, okay. um, and we've only raised 215,000. Wow! And so, to the point of the research, we've actually had two research studies conducted on our product, yeah. where financial literacy rates go up by 42 percent after 12 weeks, 25 mm -hmm. percent after an hour, and we beat our competitor in that competition where we won best learning game with the Department of Education. We're also international, mobile have been tested for special needs and actually go after the underserved community who I would deem needs financial literacy <laughs> the most. Absolutely. Um, so it is quite interesting how um, a product that is uh, 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 not as heavily validated as ours mm -hmm. continues to raise money while we have every sort of validation possible and we still kind of struggle with those disparities. So, uh, so I guess knowing that mentally when you're going into pitches how do you keep that in your head, keep that in the back of your mind, but still prepare to give an effective presentation as well? Well, I liken it to uh, everything that goes up must come down. <laughs> yeah. And so I feel as though uh, while they might be first in the market in mm -hmm. terms of a uh, financial education technology product, I feel we're going to be the people that last in the long run. Okay. So we might have a, a little bit of a hard time in the initial beginning, sure. but once we're able to firmly uh, put ourselves into the school systems and be able to get over that funding threshold where we will be expanding across the world internationally not just focus on America, mm -hmm. we believe at the end of the day we will be that financial literacy product that people rely on and come back to because we have the research to actually validate how our product improves people. And that's not something that you can just do kind of overnight. Right. That takes a, a long time mm -hmm. <laughs> to develop that research and development into a product. Absolutely. Yeah. For, for some of the viewers out there that might be watching today who are starting their own businesses, you know, perhaps they're in this same millennial category that we find ourselves in. You've got this experience giving great pitches on uh, amazing stages. Uh, 
what piece of advice would you give to them as they might prepare for some type of pitch competition that they find themselves in? Uh, we know that you won the, the case competition as well. Uh, so w walk us through that. What, what piece of advice would you give them? I would say just be as confident as possible. Um, recently in October, we actually came in ninth in the world. Wow. In the world's largest business competition, wow. um, 43 North, the state of New York. We were told that we had the best pitch in the history of 43 North. Wow. However, for whatever reason, we came in ninth and not in the top eight that received a half a million dollars and above. Yeah. Although we also came and uh, we also won the People's Choice Award. Okay. So sometimes <laughs> you just have to be resilient. Yes. You know, you have to know what you're worth inside. It definitely uh, was a down period for about a month. Like what just happened? Right. Um, but about six weeks after that, we won Best Learning Game with the Department of Education. And even though that didn't come with any money, it it kind of it picked my confidence back up because I knew we had the best product. Sure. And so I think that no matter what happens, you just have to remain confident inside. People ask me all the time, you know, how is it being a young black female mm -hmm. doing this? And I will add a, a, a fourth one onto it, a pretty young black female. Mm -hmm. That in itself is a, is a whole nother tr uh, thing that goes along with sure. it. And I tell people, be the Trojan horse, hmm. you know, get inside be that horse and destroy Troy. People tend to underestimate you, so use it to your advantage. Let people underestimate you and get all of that information from them, build your company up to a sizable point and then take them over. And so that's kind of been my approach. Absolutely. Now, uh, you know, less than one fifth of, of VC backed companies are women led. Um, you know, how do we start to close that, that gap, uh, which is really considerable right now? Yes, um, that's kind of why I'm wearing my uh, Black Tech Matters. Okay, Black Tech Matters. Um, because not only, the, the numbers actually get a little bit more dismal than that. Yeah. Only 4% of companies are represented by black women. Wow. And even worse, only 0.02% of funding went to black women last year. Wow. Despite black women having the most successful ventures out of the entire world. Okay. Also, diverse companies tend to outperform other companies by 35%. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't make sense why, why the numbers, uh, why the funding is not going towards minorities and women, um, when obviously minorities and women are actually outperforming <laughs> the status quo. So just from a uh, business perspective, <laughs> it would make sense business. to invest more in women and minorities. Absolutely. Now, um, you know, at this stage in your career with so many accomplishments, so many accolades, what is next? So, you know, what's, what's kind of what you have your sights set on now as the next major kind of benchmark that you want to make sure that you hit? Well, we're in the process of raising a million dollars. Okay. We would like to close it in the next 60 to 90 days. Okay. Obviously, with the Forbes article coming out, we have a ton of Jeez. investors coming yeah. at us. Um, we still welcome more the merrier. <laughs> <laughs> Always. <laughs> Always. Um, and it's been going really well. And so we would like to get that closed, launch Credit Stack of Saga at the end of the month, and continue to expand that game across the world and start building out the other 11 games that we have planned. We've already designed the next game. It's called Crash. Mm -hmm. um, we're actually working with PayPal on that. Oh, wow. And we plan to release that in August. So um, we have games that walk people from birth to retirement, yeah. and we plan to simulate an app along with each one of those. Wow. So we, we would like to get those games out um, and raise the funding to be able to do that. Excellent. And PayPal listed here on NASDAQ as well. So they're one of our good friends, part of the NASDAQ family. And uh, uh, Amazon as well, who rang the opening bell, who you actually, uh, you actually have a book available on Amazon right now, um, The History of the Black Dollar. Tell us about that um, and what kind of went into writing the book. Uh, were there any interesting stats, stories that came out of your research? Yes, um, that is actually my pride and joy. I've been reading black history books since I was a child, and I've always wanted to sort of write a history book that was able to educate the millennials yeah. on kind of exactly what happened mm -hmm. and why this is important to sure. you. 
And when earlier last year, for whatever reason, I just woke up and started rereading all of these black history books. Like every three days, I reread um, Harriet Tubman, Frederick Douglass, W.B. Du Bois, uh, Booker T. Washington. I just, something in me just had me reading all these books. And when I reread, when I reread Harriet Tubman's book, I realized that in 1861, mm -hmm. blacks were making 63 cents on the dollar when they were first able to receive wages. And Harriet Tubman refused to accept the wages until they were equal to whites. In fact, she did this all the way until her 90s and she was broke and ill. And that's the reason we even have a book on Harriet Tubman. In 2017, blacks made 67 cents on the dollar. Wow. So over the past 150 years, we've only moved four cents. And so I, I feel as though that's insane. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mathematically, yes. <laughs> Mathematically, that's insane, okay? And then when you also consider the story that in 1754, there were only a quarter million blacks in the country, and slavery was actually starting to come to an end because of the Revolutionary War. Right. However, around that same time, Eli Whitney invented the cotton gin. Mm -hmm. And because of that, cotton was then able to be produced at a cheaper and higher quality. By that next year, there were four million blacks in the country. Mm -hmm. And then America became the number one country in the world because they were able to produce this cotton. Sure. There have been scientists that have equated the value of that and it's something like $6 trillion. Wow. So to know that blacks directly contributed to the growth of capitalism in America, but we've only moved four cents on the dollar in the past 150 years, wow. the whole thing just doesn't make sense to me. Sure. And so that is why I wrote History of the Black Dollar it takes people on an economic journey to describe the different periods throughout black history that directly contributed to the economics of America. And then we also highlight civil rights leaders as well as rising black tech stars right now oh, wow. that aren't getting attention. Sure. You know, people like Rodney Williams and Frederick Hudson and uh, Trevor Brooks and Stephanie Lampkin. You know, these people that have invented amazing things right. and are doing amazing things, but they're not getting nowhere near the amount of attention that they should. And so we kind of want to bridge the two worlds together mm -hmm. and help people understand the past as well as where the present is currently going and have baby boomers having conversations with millennials and, and vice versa to figure out how we can firmly leverage, you know, economic empowerment and this whole tech movement mm -hmm. as sort of the next civil rights agenda. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, people like Center for Global, C Global Policy Solutions, MMTC, I was just with Jesse Jackson, with Rainbow Push. I think a lot of people are starting to realize that we really have to come together on financial economic empowerment mm -hmm. mixed together with technology as sort of the next civil rights movement. Absolutely. You mentioned a lot of great young uh, leaders in tech. Um, so naturally, as, as you know, one of the homes of tech with so many tech leaders listed here on NASDAQ, you know, the Facebooks, Netflix, Amazon, Alphabet, so forth. We have to ask you, what's your, paper, your favorite piece of tech out right now? My favorite piece of tech out right now. I would actually have to say Alexa. Alexa? Yeah. Ooh, that's my favorite too. Yeah, I think that's cool. I got some plans for Alexa. <laughs> you know, um, I think that's really cool. I also like um, the, uh, the IBM Watson. IBM Watson. Oh, okay. yes. Right. Oh, yes. It's, it's shaping intelligence as we move forward, especially when we think about healthcare and the, uh, the major ramifications that it could provide for that whole industry and, and sector, um, you know, preventing a lot of diseases where we wouldn't have had the same intel previously. So definitely it's one area that excites me as well. Definitely. Eventually, uh, with the combination of our games together, we believe we'll be able to in some form, uh, predict stock market. Okay. And so uh, I definitely see a road for artificial intelligence mm -hmm. being involved in our company. I came up with an algorithm for the stock market back in college and won Goldman Sachs Portfolio Challenge. Right, right. And people ask me all the time, why don't I just start a hedge fund? Yeah. Which would be very easy for me to do. But I think it's more important to figure out how to leverage technology to educate people on a, sure. on a larger level. There are currently 3 billion people in poverty. Wow. And 1.5 billion of them have smartphones. So there is a huge opportunity to, uh, to 
to, to leverage technology mm -hmm. on smartphones to be able to reduce poverty and increase wealth. Absolutely. Angel, great to have you here on this episode of the Millennial Report Thank and you. then awesome to discuss the future of financial literacy education. And uh, we look forward to hearing great things, more great things to come, uh, especially from the upcoming competition uh, down in Houston, Texas, correct? Yep. Perfect. Well, we'll have to have you back soon and we'll have to hear the results of that. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Millennium Report. Stay tuned for more coming from the NASDAQ market site throughout the rest of the day.